The first game of my senior year, I'm in great shape. But unfortunately, I broke my foot. I had never been hurt a day in my life. My very first game, I broke my foot. I threw me a pity party. My trainer came to me and says, Walter, we can get you back for the Big Ten season. We can get you back, son. We can get you right back in five weeks. I said, Roger, when I come out of surgery, I want you to take me to the stationary bike, put me on the bike, and take my cast to the pedal. But well, Walter, when you come out of surgery, you're going to be on, the, on morphine, and you won't feel like it. Go back and rest. I said, Roger, I don't have time to rest. Can you do that favor for me? Can you take me to the stationary bike, put me on the bike, and take my cast to the pedal? As soon as surgery was over, he carried me to the stationary bike, put me on that bike, and he taped my cast to the pedal, and I had a customary workout that was symbolic that I don't have time to rest. I had tears in my eyes as I pedaled that bike, and I thought to myself, I can't quit. I can't give up. I came back in six weeks. We playing against the Ohio State Buckeyes on national TV. They had a guy named Jimmy Jackson at that time. On national TV, me and Jimmy Jackson are going at it. In the first half, I had 15 points, five rebounds, and five assists. And as the first half ran out, I pulled up for my patented baseline jump shot, and I felt my foot break again. I've been trained to follow through. Every day in practice, my coach would say, Walter, shoot it like you own it, baby. Shoot it like it's yours. Even though I felt my foot break, I still followed through. And my last college basketball shot went in all nets because I've been trained to follow through. You have to be disciplined every single day and train yourself to follow through on all your fundamentals and that's how you're going to be successful. You have to do it when you don't feel like it. You have to do it when you feel discouraged. You have to do it when you don't feel healthy. You have to do it when you're under the weather. Every single day, you have to train yourself to focus and commit to your business and follow through. My college career was over. I got offered a job to become a hospital administrator. Two-year program, $75,000 job. And right before I took the job, my daddy called me on the phone. Let me tell you about my daddy. When I was a little boy, my daddy would always pick me up. When he came home from work, he picked me up. When he saw me in the nursery after church, he picked me up. No matter how long he worked, no matter how tired he was, my daddy would always pick me up. So when I had my kids, I would always pick up my kids. When I got home, sometimes I was tired. They have a bottle in one hand, and they just lifted up the other hand, and they knew what daddy was supposed to do. My job was to pick them up. This is a spiritual interaction. When you pick up a child, it is a spiritual transaction. When you pick up a child, you change their perspective. When you pick up a child, all of a sudden they can see the world the way you see it. I don't care what your children have done, there is nothing they can do for you to stop picking them up. When my daughter's a drug addict, I don't care, pick her up. My son messes up, I don't care, pick him up. I don't care. You pick them up. That is your job, mama. That is your job, daddy. That is your job, grandma. That is your job, granddad. Your number one job is to pick them up and change their perspective. My saddest day, one day, my daddy looked at me and he said, boy, you're too big. I can't pick you up anymore. But when he couldn't pick me up physically, he would pick me up emotionally. He would pick me up spiritually. I had a great dad because he would always pick me up. He would always change my perspective. So my daddy called me on the phone. He asked me a question. He said, son, you had a tough new year. What's next? I said, dad, I'm going to be a hospital administrator. He said, not bad, but let me ask you a question, son. Do you believe you're an NBA player? You can't outproduce yourself in this, son. If you don't think so, go take the job. But if you believe you're an NBA player, go for it. My dad had the self-control and discipline and waited for my answer. And my answer was yes. You're right, dad. 
I can't work the rest of my life. But playing in the NBA is a dream. I've had it ever since I was a little boy. He said, go for it, son. I limped back into my coach's office with the cast of my foot. I said, coach, what do I need to do to play in the NBA? I asked that question four years in a row. With tears in his eyes, he said, son, when I recruited you, I heard you was a mama's boy. But I'm here to tell you, you're just like your daddy. But what, what do I need to do to play in the NBA? He said, do two things you can play in the NBA. Lose 20 pounds or shoot a three-point shot with range, you can play in the NBA. I think you should be a motivational speaker, son, but <laughs> if you lose 20 pounds or shoot a three-point shot with range, you can play in the NBA. I lost 20 pounds, and every day I would shoot 500 shots a day, every single day. I got invited to training camp with the Dallas Mavericks, and not only did I make the team, I became the first ever undrafted rookie free agent in the history of the Dallas Mavericks to start opening night. was going through my mind. I had not started a basketball game since high school. I got to the arena and they dimmed the lights and they put the spotlight right on me. Right through the spotlight I saw my mom, my dad, and all my brothers and sisters. They surprised me at the game. Then I saw my dad. And I just pumped my fist. And he pumped his fist and tears streamed down my face. Thank you for all those timeouts. <laughs> Thank you for making sure I was always home when the street lights came on. Thank you for making sure I could always hear your voice. Thank you for always changing my perspective. <laughs> I know what it feels like to sit on a bench. I know what it feels like to get knocked down. I know what it feels like to have a hope and a dream. And nobody believes in it but a few people. Go for your dreams. Don't live life with regrets. Go for your dreams. Don't live life with regrets. Go for your dreams. Don't live life with regrets. I could always hear my daddy's voice. You have children, you have grandchildren. Can your children and grandchildren hear your voice? I could always hear my daddy's voice. He would say, go out, have a good time, play with your friends, but don't let the street lights beat your home. When I started my motivational speaking business, I called my daddy and said, Daddy, I'm going to be a motivational speaker. He said, son, you think you can be successful at it? I said, yes, sir. You think you can make a lot of money at it? I said, yes, sir. He says, go for it. That's all my daddy said to me was go for it. So when I think about life, when I think about my goals, one thing he did for me as a father is to make sure I was always where I was supposed to be. He would have me write my goals down, and he would check in periodically, basically asking me, Walter, where are you supposed to be? Fathers, do you realize how powerful that is? If you ask that question of your kids, what are your goals, what are your future, who do you want to be when you grow up, and every now and then check in by asking a simple question, where are you supposed to be? The bell is ringing, and I came to ring your bell and ask you the question, Father, where are you supposed to be? And ask that question to your children. Where are you supposed to be? And don't you quit until you're number one. Okay, you sure this time? <laughs> so, sorry. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? Uh, I'd like to welcome you here on Father's Day. Um, my dad's 86, and it's, I'm still glad to have him here. I love having him here each year to preach when, um, when we have Father's Day. 
Pete is here this year, one of our um, missionaries, Pete Ware, so he is here as well. He's going to um, say some things, and I'll have Dave um, finish up. But this morning, take a look at your announcements. Um, I, I will give you an idea. I don't know how long service is going to go. I just know I have a lunch appointment at 1 o'clock. So as long as we can get there before 1, I, I'm good, okay? So, um, so if, if you get tired or you walk out, we locked the doors already. You can't get out. So um, you're stuck here until we're finished. So... Um, that said, um, looking at our announcements this morning, number of announcements. We do have Bible study tomorrow night. We're going through the book of Isaiah. You're more than welcome to join us for that. Um, we're doing that verse by verse, and maybe a little more than verse by verse. Um, but we've been, we're almost out of chapter one, um, and it's been a couple months now. So just keep that in mind. And also, Dave's Bible study, their next one is going to be um, the 27th of June. Hopefully next Saturday, the wave will take place. So we'll do that Saturday night at 6.30, and you can join us for that. Um, Greek support, Lori's going to start that back up in August, so August 21st uh, on Wednesday nights from 6 to 30 to 8, she'll have that going on, as well as um, every, uh, the first Saturday usually of the month, um, she does her expressive art class, well this time it'll be the second Saturday, so it'll be July 13th because of, um, that's the 4th of July weekend, the first one. And then also game night, they do that on the, the 12th of July, so keep those things in mind. Um, Let's see our VBS. Our VBS is going to take place from July 18th. I mean July 15th through the 19th. Um, if you're interested in helping, please either see me or Tony or Krista and let us know. Um, our next pancake breakfast is Saturday, June 29th, and uh, they're going to set up on that Friday before, so the 28th. And they're going to do that at noon. So he does need volunteers. If you have any questions, you can ask Bill. So just keep that in mind as well. And let's see. I think that pretty much, the only other thing is Kristen wants me to make sure, sounds like Barb now, you sign the little green pads at the end of the pew and pass them to everybody alongside you. So um, so that if you'll do that while you have the chance here, and then let's get up and pass the peace of God to one another this morning. Okay, we're going to do the call to worship this morning, so if you'll get back to your seats. And if you're able to stand with me this morning, stand. <laughs> And this is a rare morning where I actually wear shorts and sandals only because I'm not preaching this morning. So um, that said, we're going to do the call to worship. I read non-bold, you read bold. And if you're able to stand with me this morning, please, would you please stand? God, a thousand years are but a day to you. Lord, help us learn to be still and wait on you. Your word is a powerful two-edged sword. Let us say these words out loud when we are crushed, depressed, and broken. But you guys went down a little bit there. Um, there is victory in Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend. Amen. Okay, so. Um, I will share with you that um, one of the things when I was watching that video with my dad and, and the thing that kind of came up to me was um, you learn a lot of lessons from your parents and sometimes you learn good things, sometimes you learn bad things. One of the most important things I think I ever remember was, um, was a lesson. I was helping him deliver papers and he left his truck in gear and we both got out of the car and the truck started rolling down the street. And so... He's running full speed to get back in the, the truck to get the truck to stop. And he gets to the truck and he jumps in and he hits the brake and puts it in park just as he taps this old car at the end of the street. And the car hadn't moved for years or anything else. And at that point, um, the guy, he, he knocks on the door and tells the guy, I think I hit your car, here you go. It was barely a noticeable dent. When the guy saw it and the guy, everything, he got it and said it was, it was $1,500 worth of damage. And my dad went ahead and gave the guy the money for it. He went ahead and, and said, look, you know what? I did this. Here you go. Um, I'm going to give you the money to take care of it. And he did it. And I remember thinking, this is so unfair. He really didn't hit your car. And it's old and it's junky. But, and I, you know, doing the right thing was something 
that you learn from them, and you learn to do the right thing a lot of times from those people you're around, and your parents are very important with that. So that said, this morning, we're going to sing, This Is My Father's World, okay? So that's the first hymn. If you'll rise with me this morning, we're going to sing that. morning and as we do that we already did share a praise so this is what I want to do is if I can have a couple of the kids come up and help me with this can I have a couple of kids come up and help me um Em you can come up yeah you come on come on Chris okay this is what we're going to do I'm going to ask the men if you're over 18 to stand up because this is Father's Day and in relation to the church men are, are part of that so if you'll stand up this morning what I'm going to ask you guys to do is give each man that's standing a pen okay and give them a pen, and once they get a pen, they'll sit down. Okay, so here you go, guys. Okay, got them, and here you go. Okay, so whoever you can find, stand up, give them to them. I was going to say, <laughs> you want to help you got your waffle. Thank you, guys. So we're going to ask the men that just were standing to stand back up again. Okay? So if you're standing, if you have a pen, you stand. And let's pray over the fathers this, this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in the precious name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, we ask for the men that are standing this morning, that Lord, you would just um, instill in them godly wisdom, godly direction and discernment. That Lord, they would lead their families and lead their loved ones with, with the love that only comes from Jesus. And so Lord, I pray that their hearts would be open to you, receptive. But also, Lord, they would be the kind of godly men that... Um, their families would just treasure and hold on to. And we thank you, Lord, for each one of us here that we have fathers, that whether they're here or they're with our Heavenly Father in he heaven, Lord, we are giving you praise this morning because we can celebrate Father's Day because we have a good, good Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys, you can take your seats. Well, actually, I'm going to have you all stand because we got one more hymn this morning to do. So, um, amazing grace. Huh? Yep. Up and down, up and down. So, here we go. Amazing Grace, 202, Amazing Grace.
See, you can't ever always plan. You never know what's going to happen. So here we go. So. So, we've been there for 10,000 years, bright shining as the Amen. You can take your seats this morning. I am very off with the rest of you. So here we go. Dave is going to come up and he's going to do reading this morning from Luke chapter 15. So. You got the pulpit mic? Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11, the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf. He has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat 
so I could celebrate with my friends. But w when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He is lost and now is found. So this morning, if you have a need for prayer, um, anything emotional, physical, spiritual, whatever it may be, when we pray to the Lord this morning, just raise it up to him. Just in your heart, say to God as we're praying, yes, God, I need a touch from you. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. We ask that, Lord, um, whatever it is that we're struggling with, whatever we bring to you this morning, that, Lord, you would hear our prayers, that you would hear our hearts, that, Lord, we really come before you to stand and just just reflect on the awesomeness and the greatness of who you are, God. We pray for um, the physical needs, the spiritual needs, the financial needs, whatever need it may be that, Lord, that are brought to you this morning, that you would meet them. That, Lord, we would not go out of here without a touch uh, of just, uh, uh, just to hear your voice, to hear your heart. That, Lord, you would move in power. That, Lord, we would see you in a way we haven't seen you before. Lord, I just pray that in our hearts as we spend this time this morning in your word and talking about who you are, that, Lord, we would have just a glorious Father's Day. Lord, I pray for the fathers that they would be more like you, that they would strive to be like you. And that, Lord, we would see just a, a change in the heart of this country because of how the fathers live and how the fathers grow. And that, Lord, it would be an influence on their kids. And so we ask this all in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I guess at this point we're going to take the offering. So if I could have our ushers come down forward this morning. Let's continue praising the Lord with Run to the Father.
to really introduce um, a very, very, very close friend of mine. It's someone that I grew up with. Uh, we started school together in first grade, and we attended the same church, the same youth group, and um, we grow up and go to college and part ways, but uh, the sign of a good friend, a true friend, is that you never really lose touch with them. So uh, this is one of the missionaries that we now support. He is the ministry leader out at uh, California University of Pennsylvania. Um, about an hour south of Pittsburgh, PA, and so it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce Pete Ware. Yeah, it's, it's, Facebook's nice on connecting us with each other, and um, when you start raising support as part of your job, then you reach out to friends that you haven't seen in a while, and they're like, hey, come to my church, and I was like, Oh, it's on the beach. Let's go. Um, we'll do that thing. So it's been it's been fun to reconnect in that way. And um, as Union Church of Love has been a supporter, I don't know how it's it's been almost ten years. I think about um, in that way that I get to serve as a missionary. You know, people ask you what you do. As my technical title is a campus minister. And I don't like to say that when I first meet people, because you know sometimes when you meet students, they think bad and they throw up a wall thinking you're going to hit them with a 50-pound Bible. And I'm insulted by that because I could at least swing a 100-pound Bible. Um, or they start telling you all their, your sins, and you're like, well, that sounds fun. And um, and but part of what I do to describe what I do as a campus minister is that I'm just a little further down the road than than students. And there's an old saying by a guy named D.T. Niles, or N.T. Niles, I always forget which one it is, D or N. But um, he said, he would say, Christianity is just like one beggar showing other beggars where they find bread. And I like to say it's like one college guy showing other college guys where he found free pizza. Um, as we're going to hear, we heard the scripture reading earlier, God invites us back into the party. Um, you know. We get what we need from God. And so truthfully, I'm, I'm somebody that's just further down the road than students and help them engage, explore, continue to grow in their faith along the journey. And um, so, you know, I'll say this. I do have a little sign-up sheet if you want to sign up for my newsletters or things like that. I have an older newsletter back there. I'd love to keep in touch because... You know, it does, I do need to feed myself. So, you know, that type of thing and, and provide different things for students. And and how, the, what that looks like on campus takes lots of different forms. Um, some of it is we give away, you know, root beer floats for an organization fair. And we get a root beer keg and we give away that and we have a fun time and have a little party on campus to help students connect with one another and connect with our ministry. And so, and that just builds relationships. We do different activities on campus. Over the time since I've been at um, Cal U, as we call it, since 2008, there's trust that's been built. And so through that time it started, some of it for me was after football games, I stood by the locker room and every time the team comes in after a game, win or lose, I would be there just shaking hands, dabbing up the guys. And through that process, you know, we had some things through COVID, we had a death of the t on the team. 
and the trust that's built, so much so that our, our football coach this, this year, he's like, Pete, you come to anything we have. Like, he invites me up to practice just to be on the sideline and connect with the guys. And he, you come to, he's like, you're part of our staff. And so that's, that's the trust built, you know. And he's and we have a great relationship. And I have a about this year we had about three different Bible studies with the football team, just in, throughout the time. Guys that are all across the things. One guy that came in was gangbusters, ready to be involved, and he's our leader already in our ministry. Other guys that are just checking it out and exploring it. Then also the um, the volleyball coach this past fall invited me to share with the team. And I, like before the, sem the semester started, as they were in their preseason, and I did a little activity that I like doing around worldview. And through that, that time of, of that discussion, talking about what's it, we all have a different worldview, or we all have a worldview. So most people don't think about what their worldview is. And I have this worldview that comes from the Bible that God created everything good the way it ought to be, you know. Everything is broken because of Genesis, because of sin and what happened in the fall in Genesis chapter 3. We all look out, God's in a, redeemed it back to himself because of the work of Jesus did on the cross. And I look forward to the restoration of all things, and that's how I live with hope. And so I did this little activity that's a fun thing with the, with the team and kind of explained, like, hey, I want to invite you. And part of that is just helping them to think through, hey, how do I actually look at the world? What does it look, mean to engage with what's wrong with the world? How can I fix it? You know, I think Jesus is the only fix, but helping them kind of explore that thing. So I did that activity, and then from that, I invited them. I was like, hey, I don't know if any of you would be interested, but I do a thing I call the four-week blitz that I invite you to go through a Bible study through those things. Turns out a few of these young ladies wanted to do this. Sophia, um, one of the tall middle hitters, you know, kind of was a catalyst when getting the other young lady. She was involved with the church growing up, but struggled her first year or so, got involved, started bringing. And we had, sometimes we had 10, usually about an average of five, that come in throughout the year. Early in the year, there was a young lady named Ashlyn. No background, just kind of exploring things, checking out. She would miss Frequently, she had some things going on, but as the year went on, you know, Ashlyn kept on kind of more and more questions, and I can remember about a month before the end of the the um, year, just having a, it was a smaller group, it was just um, her friend Ray and Sophia there that day, and Ashlyn, you like, you're like, you ready to trust in Jesus? Are you right there? And we're trying to encourage her. To, to kind of like, hey, there's a spot. And one of my things that I try to do to help students think is I just want to help them know where they're at. You know, I can't decide for them, you know, and I can push them and get them to do something, but I wanted them to be really clear. Have they trusted in Jesus? Because one of my failures as a campus minister is if somebody goes through my ministry and thinks they're saved and they're not really. Like, that's, that's an epic fail. You know, if, they, if they're still wrestling with it, that's okay, and I'm okay with it. Well, I got this about two weeks after school. I got this text message from Ashlyn. Pete, I hope you're doing well. I wanted to share something important with you. After thinking and praying a lot, I finally made a decision to trust God completely. I've been asking for guidance and feel, and I feel like I re I've received an answer. This decision brings me a lot of peace and gratitude. I want to thank you for your help and support. Your advice has meant a lot to me, and I appreciate it more than words can say. And that's the hope that we can provide. And part of your partnership with me in doing this allows me to be there and engage students like that, like Ashlyn. And so that's one little bit of, of the ministry that I do through these Bible studies. Another young lady that didn't come to our Bible study but started coming to our regular Wednesday night large group meeting and this is one way that you can also partner with us as you go to bed on Wednesday nights you probably I'm guessing nine ish ten ish as you go to bed on Wednesday nights maybe earlier some you know but as you go to bed on Wednesday nights can you please pray for the ministry that I do because Wednesdays at 9 p.m. is when we start our fellowship meeting 
and that's when we meet. It's after classes and everything, and that's when college students are up. So we start that. You know, I, so I drink a lot of coffee. Um, but, but we do that. And so I invite people, as you think about it, to pray for, for our ministry on Wednesday nights while you're going to bed as we, we gather. Well, another young lady started coming out, and she was, she was hanging out. Allie, she wasn't part of our Bible study, ended up joining the Bible study later in the year. And she came to faith coming to our, to our fall or to our um, big Jubilee conference in the spring. But it's also helping students that have grown up in the church that are struggling through it. And one of the passages that I wanted to just share, this is my Bible. Um, it has a lot of packing tape on it because I use one of the Bibles often that, that we give to students because we like to have them and we just give them out. So, so I use it. I think we're getting new ones this year. So. Um, I'll get a, a fresh one. But this is a, a verse that has kind of gripped me personally, but it's been helpful to help students think through, what does it look like to trust God when you're being tempted and, and to be challenged by him? And it's, it's from James, and it's fitting Father's Day. It says, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not... Um, change like shifting shadows. And every, the idea of every good and perfect gift, when we're tempted, we are tempted because we're tempted that something other than God is good and perfect or better, you know. And, and Peyton, one of my student leaders, grew up in the church, really had a particular struggle with something. He sent me, I asked a couple of students to send me a, just a text message of like, hey, what's something that stuck out to you this year, how you were growing and how, what God did you? And he sent me this. He said, when I am tempted, the best way to defend myself to rem is to remember that God is with me at all times and that choosing obedience is always worth it because every good and perfect gift comes from God. And I hope that may be an encouragement to you, you know, in your temptations. Every time I'm tempted to do something that I know is wrong, it's because, you know, I think that God is holding something from us. That's what Eve did and Adam did in the garden. You know, they thought God was holding something from them. And it's a sweet thing. The more that we can remember that God is good and he's perfect, that he has that opportunity. So I want to thank you. You know, this is in many ways just a praise report of what God is doing. There are ups and downs and challenges. This year has been one of the most fun years of ministry um, that I've had, you know, in, in doing it, just seeing it, watching God continue to grow. But your support, both prayer and financially, is what allows me to be able to be present to share. I just shared I'm a trainer with our new staff, and I just talked to them last week. Part of our ministry is modeling what Jesus did. Jesus was incarnational. That's what we talk about at Christmas. He came here in person form to, to be with us, you know, and that's what you allow me to do. You let me to be present. And sometimes I think, you know, okay, God, I'm getting older. Dave and, Dave and I have a lot more gray around our face. What's he doing here? And one of the sweet things that I do is as I'm sitting across a table from a student, I'll sit there and like, you know, there's no real reason for you and I to be sitting across from each other. You know, like I'm cool and all, but I ain't that cool. Unless God was doing something. And God is doing sweet work there. And I appreciate your partnership and support in allowing me to, to be present there. And like I said, if you're interested in just kind of keeping on a mail, mailing list, like that, there is um, need for more support that way. I have a newsletter, you can grab one of them as well. But thanks again for letting me be a part of your congregation from afar and be a missionary that way. So thank you. So um, I do want to share with you guys that um, on um, Thursday night, Millie accepted Christ, and so I'm, Millie, I just want to say congratulations, she accepted Christ, and everybody just tell her we're so glad that she did that, because one of the things she said to us last night when we were having dinner was that she told some friends, and they were kind of like, oh, okay, so 
before you leave today, just give her a hug and say, man, we are so glad you're part of the family of God, okay? So amen, thank you. <laughs> so I get the opportunity at least once a year to do this, to bring my dad up and, and speak, and um, he's going to share with you what God's laid on his heart. Um, when we talk on the phone, a lot of times we get into conversations about God, and, and I've been preaching through Revelation, so sometimes that's the heart of our conversation is we'll spend half hour, 45 minutes just talking about Revelation and, um, and what we see going on with all that. So um, it is great to have him still be able to do this at 86 years old. So I'm going to have him come up this morning, and he's going to share. So, Dad, if you'll come up, and I'll put this on you so you can speak. So come on up. Well, I'm certainly glad to be here. I really enjoy coming here. There's nothing I like better than to be around people that you can talk about God and, and you, you're not worried about they, they thinking you're a little cracked. But, uh, <laughs> but I won't be long enough to uh, keep you from lunch because <laughs> I know for a long time I said, you know, call me anything but late to dinner. So. So what I want to talk about are angels. I, uh, several months ago, I started, when I was praying at night, I started including angels in my prayers. I, I don't know why, it just, just kept doing it. You know, our guardian angels and the host of angels in the heavens. And, uh, and so I really got interested and started looking up angels. And uh, it goes back to the very creation. You know, in Ephesians, to me, the wondrous story that before the world was created, God knew who would be, who would believe in his foreknowledge and wrote them down. And they, they are appointed to inherit like the kingdom of heaven. And it's amazing to me that before the world was created, he thought about us. And, and then, if that doesn't prove grace, because grace is an unmerited favor, a gift from God, well, we weren't even there when grace was given to us. And, and uh, then, you know, we started the creation. The creation is, is just a place that he made for his children to live. And it, it's like when we're having a baby and you fix up the room and you get curtains and buy some furniture or something. Well, that's what God was doing to the creation. So that creation is a glorious thing to him. But the creation of man is greater than the creation. I don't know if you can imagine it. <laughs> Every time I think about it, it's like it, I just can't believe it that he cared that much about us. And I, so then he created the angels, and the angels were meant to minister to mankind. That's the only reason they were created. There was like no other special appointment for them but to serve mankind. And I know sometimes they can get mixed up with the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's purpose is different than the angels. The Holy Spirit, like he, he said in uh, Jeremiah, that I will take away their hearts of stone and give them a heart of flesh, and I will write my words on their heart and in their minds. And, but, and, and so that's actually the definition of God, because Jesus said, like, your father is a spirit, and he wants to be worshiped as a spirit. And these things I tell you, they are spirit and they are truth. And so that's what comes inside of us. When God writes it on inside of us, it's actually God living within us. And that, that we are to be the heirs of, of the kingdom of heaven, his children. And so like the, the uh, creation, he built it to put 
his people in there, his sons and daughters in there. Of course, you know, the sons and daughters messed it up a little bit, but you can see like how much, how, how much he cared about us. Like it, it's amazing when you really think about how much, how important you are. And the angels, like, like I was reading in Jeremiah where he said, I know my plans I have for you. There are plans for good and not evil, and plans that you will prosper and you will have, you will have a, a future. And uh, I looked up the word evil, and it says catastrophe. He, he actually is going to protect you from the catastrophes of life. You're not going to die with a train running over you or a bridge collapsing or a, a hurricane or a tornado. No, he has an appointed end for you. And like, if you, all, you, you have to believe. You have to believe that he means these things and he'll do these things. It's just like the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit like, comes like when, when you ask what Jesus told Nicodemus. Like when Nicodemus said, how can I be born again? Can I go into my mother and, and be born again? And, and uh, Jesus told him, like, you who are evil can give good gifts to your children. If your children ask for bread, would you give them a stone? If he asked for a fish, would you give him a serpent? How much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? And you know whether you have it or not, because when you receive it, you know it, you, you feel it, you know it, and you'll never forget that day. And that day lasts, uh, in my, it was like a couple months, for me, but, but, when you, and, but if, you've done, if you haven't experienced that, then you know you don't have the Holy Spirit. So just pray to the Father, ask him for the Holy Spirit. And he said he'll be glad to give it to you. So that like when, when you have to believe in the Holy Spirit and what he does, he te he's a teacher. He teaches us about the Father, his words. He brings his words to our memory. And everything he does is different than, than what the what the angels do, because the angels do things man can't do for himself. Like when you see all the things they did in the old in the Old Testament, all the times they were they were delivered, and all the things they did for them. And then in Hebrews we read about all the people who died because of their faith. Well, they had a choice. That's persecution. They could have denied Christ and be delivered from that sentence of death, but they rather die and, and receive the rewards that's waiting for them than to save their life for a few years on this earth. I mean, I don't know how, like I always think when I see some of these celebrities that are dying, you think, wow, that, that time went fast. And what did they have done in their life before if they made any compromises about faith it, and all of a sudden, it's over. I, and even if they live to be 100 years old, I know from my own experience, those years fly by. And it, it's no time at all. And the, the, uh, the, the uh, angels delivered them in the Old Testament because that was, that was their job. And it's still his job to deliver us. But we, we have to know what he's going to do and what he's not going to do. And he's not going to save you if you deny God. So in the, in the long run, you know, it looks like these people in, in the New Testament, like when they were talking, it was talking about those who, who survived or didn't survive. Like those that survived, yeah, they were delivered. But those who didn't, that was their choice. They just they, they had a chance. They could have denied God and, and walked out of that that situation, but they didn't and they wouldn't do it. So, so that's that's really talked about believing what he says. When he says, like, you know, I, I I got the picture of like, yeah, well, there's he writes your name and and, and you are guaranteed a a a, a, a future, a like you're not going to be smashed under some terrible disaster. 
like, it, I know we see it, but believe me, it, it, I, I've heard many stories about people who would look like there was no way out. This one story I, I read about a woman who was driving on the freeway in Texas, and they had like a, a stone or a block wall or something on the left, and a, like a tractor trailer on the right. And all of a sudden, a tractor trailer jackknifed in the road up ahead. And there was no way that she could stop. She said all she did was close her eyes and say, Jesus, Jesus. She said if she opened her eyes, she was on the other side of the truck. I mean, you can't explain those things. I mean, that's, that's got to be the angels working in our behalf. And then and if you ever had a time when, when I know a couple times I needed a verse in the Bible and I start thinking about it, and it would come to me. And I said, that's, that's the Holy Spirit working, excuse me, teaching you, teaching you about God, teaching you about Jesus, and, and bringing his words to you understand them. That's, that's really like the difference between the, t between the two. And it, it's not been, I don't think the, the, the angels have been spoken about enough. I think they are so strong and so powerful in the world that like, yeah, well, you, that's what you need. When you look at, at the population, the world, everything that's going on today, say, yeah, you need somebody to protect you. You need somebody to deliver you. And, and believe that that's what he'll do. And, and pray and ask to know that the wisdom and knowledge and the understanding you get, ask God for it. Like, I know I was praying for about angels and I don't know why, all of a sudden, I started praying months ago about angels. And all of a sudden, I got interested, and I started looking them up. And I was amazed. I mean, the things they did. I mean, look at the, like, when, uh, when Peter was, was arrested, and, and uh, he, was through, through, he was supposed to have his head cut off the next day. Peter was sleeping, and the angel came in and had to kick him and wake him up. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was going to get my head cut off the next day, I wouldn't be sleeping that sound during the night. But you can imagine, he was, he was so confident in that whatever happened would be God's will. We have to trust in the will of God. And, like, and yeah, well, this angel took him right out and took him, opened all the gates and took the chains off of him. The chains fell off. And they walked right out of the prison. It, like The things that were done for those people. I mean, look at, at, at even Mary, when the angel came and told Mary that she was going to be the, the mother of the, the Son of God. And like, like she, she accepted it. And like it was like, yeah, well, if an angel talks to you and tells you something, I always thought, well, it doesn't take a lot of faith then. You know, like Abraham. Abraham was, con you know, he believed God. It was considered, you know, like righteous. Well, if God speaks to you, I think it, it doesn't take a whole lot of faith to say, well, you know, I'll, I'll do what he says. Like even Zacharias, when, when John the Baptist was going to be born, him and his wife, they were old in their years and past their time. But they, they were praying all the time that they wanted a son. And the angel Gabriel came to him and told him he was going to have a son. And he sort of didn't believe him. He almost accused Gabriel that, like uh, not being honest or truthful. So Gabriel said, well, because you doubted me, you won't speak until all things are completed. And that's what happened. He, he couldn't talk until the day that John the Baptist was born, and he had to name him John, because he was told to name him John. And John the Baptist, like Jesus said, like there, there's none greater in the world than John the Baptist. But those who would believe are greater than John. So, and I believe it's because of what we know. John didn't know as much as, as we have been taught in the New Testament. And I think that's like the reason that like, yeah, well, John the Baptist, I've heard people say he didn't do miracles, but when you look at how the king, 
the king liked John the Baptist, and he thought that that uh, Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Because it, it, why would he have thought that? With all the things Jesus done, there must have been a comparison between in the king's mind between between John the Baptist and Jesus, or else he wouldn't consider them being the same person. Well, it, those miracles, we have all those things in our ability. We can depend upon the uh, angels because that's their job. They will, they will do what they're told to do. And, and uh, the Holy Spirit does what he's supposed to do. He teaches us about Jesus. He, he reminds us of the things that Jesus told us. And, and it, there, is no, there is no greater knowledge, I think, than having the knowledge that God is for you. God is on your side, and God wants you to survive. He wants you to have an appointed time, not to be all of a sudden like you were bugged being squashed on somebody's foot. Now, there's, you can count on God, and you can trust God, and that's what he wants. He wants people to trust in him. And that's like, I think I've learned over the years more than anything else was to trust in God no matter how things look, no matter what you saw, and no matter what it seemed. No, just trust that God is good and God will see you through. I, now, I'm, I've never been to a Bible college. I've never like been to a Bible school. I don't claim to be a teacher. I don't claim to be an evangelist or, or any, any agency of, of God. But I know what I've learned over the years. And I've known God has proven to be faithful to his word. And he has delivered us many times. That's, that, that's my experience. And all you have to do is really read his words. Read Jesus' words. He's telling you about the Father. That was one of his jobs. He came to take the punishment for our sins and take away our sins. He came to, talk, to teach us about the Father. And he also came to tell us what the Father wanted us to hear. Because Jesus said, I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say. And, and that's, that's part of like the whole thing in life. Yeah, to get through this life, to trust in God, to believe what he says, to believe in his son, believe what his son says, and, and do what he says. It's not those who say, Lord, Lord, but those who do what I say will enter in. So I hope, I hope it makes some kind of a, a dent in, in your thinking. I could put you on the right track. But not saying that you're not. I'm not accusing anybody, but I don't know. You know, I, 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 and I don't judge anybody. But if you know you don't have the Holy Spirit, seek him, pray to him, believe he'll give it to you, and you'll receive it, and you'll know it. Believe me, you'll know it. But I guess Todd got plenty of time for lunch. I got plenty of time. Um, so, yeah, but we're not done yet because I got one more speaker. I got Dave. So, um, and I was looking, uh, put the picture back up for a second with my family. So in this picture, this was a number of years ago. My mom was still alive at this point. She's been gone for over three years and a couple of my brothers are missing out of that. But um, realize this is, that's not everyone. So um, that's a small group of us when we're together. So um, yeah, it's, it's, I have to try it again. So, and my sister is here with her husband, so um, I'm glad to have them. So, this morning I'm going to introduce Dave to speak. So, um, he knows he's only got about 10 minutes. What? So. <laughs> I got a lot to talk about. Remember, we were. Well, you need so. to start having me speak before your dad because this is really <laughs> tough to try to follow that. You know, you got it. Uh, uh, well, you're going to have to grant me a couple extra minutes because I'm talking about the two favorite things in my life my son and God. Uh, quick about this story. Drexel was about uh, six or seven years old. We were at the beach up here in Lavalette. And at that time, he loved to get thrown up in the air. I do too, because that's my idea of my bond between me and, and my son. Fast forward to nine years old. He's playing baseball. And to make the final out of the game, 
He's in center field, and right before going to center field, he's crying in the dugout to me because he wants to play shortstop. I was not the head coach. Uh, his mother's cousin was the head coach, so I have to say, the coach put you in center field because he wants you to play center field. So go be the best center fielder that you can. So with tears in his eyes, he goes walking out to center field. With one out and a runner on first base, he makes this unbelievable over his shoulder catch, looks at it as a snow cone in his glove, and then has enough sense to throw a P to first base because the runner thought the ball was over his head. She was standing on second. Double play ends the game. He's ecstatic. He's not upset that he's playing center field anymore. He comes in, I'm ecstatic because it's my son. I throw him up in the air like this. He comes down and says, Dad, don't ever do that again. <laughs> At that point, I knew he was too old to get thrown up in the air anymore. Um, just, I will keep this quick. Um, I do enjoy talking about God and my son and trying to correlate what the idea of a father I get from my father in heaven is. And to tell you a quick story again, uh, related more to that, I work as an electrical mechanic for the railroad at night, so I know a little bit about electricity. Um, I know enough to know that it can be very dangerous. So when my son was still incubating, of course we go to all the classes and we talk to other new parents and everybody has advice on what you should do and the number one piece of advice I got is you should put those child protective things on your outlets. And I went, no, I'm not doing that. And they're like, you're crazy. He could stick something in there and he could get fried. And you know, what if he takes a knife or a little thing? And I said, first of all, he's not gonna have access to knives. Second of all, he's only gonna do it once. <laughs> if he's smart. So we'll do two things. Either he's smart because he's never gonna do it again, or he's a little dumb because he's trying it again and we need to address that. <laughs> I'm happy to say he never stuck anything in an outlet. And he's a very smart kid because he never even tried to stick anything into an outlet, right? But the point of that story is I felt like as a father, I can't hover over him and put him in a bubble. As much as I want to sometimes, I have to allow my son to be able to experience life on his own sometimes. In Proverbs 26, 22, 6, raise up a child in the ways of the Lord and he'll carry you with him always, something like that, forever, right? So my focus was to try to raise a godly son and put him on that path and certainly teach him about the ways of life. But in my household, it was first God and then everyday living. And I knew that both of those things he was going to have to learn to experience and learn on his own. And I thought, how is that like our father in heaven? And then we go and I read the prodigal son today. And in the prodigal son, it tells a story about the father who doesn't want his son to go and experience life, knows that it's better for him to stay in the household and work for him because he can be secure, he can be taken care of financially, physically, mentally. But yet against his own will, he says, okay, I will give you everything that you deserve when I'm gone, and I will give it to you now. And the son goes out and squanders it. And that can happen. But yet the son had enough sense to say, I can't do this. I need to crawl back to my father. Now the world would say the father should never have accepted that kid. Once you're gone, you're gone. And I know men that are like that, and I cannot relate to that. They say, if you choose to do that, you are no longer my son. You go out into the world, you figure it out on your own. How could you say that? It's your son. I want to be more like the father, and I hope I never have to be, but I want to be more like the father in the story, and God our father. That no matter what you do, and no matter where you go, God will always be there on the porch watching you so that when you turn back to him, he will go running to you to pick you up maybe throw you in the air and welcome you home because we are never going to be too big for God to throw us up in the air as long as he catches us. That's one thing I always did, always caught him. I use this analogy a lot too. I feel like we go through this Christian life in this world on a doggy leash, on God's doggy leash. And it's one of those retractable doggy leashes, right? Sometimes our doggy leash could be really, really long. 
It can be so long that we go to the left and we go to the right. And God just lets it go. And he lets it go. And he lets it go. But God is such a God of love that when he sees we've gone a little too far or when too much danger is lurking, he pushes that button and we stop. And we can't go any further. And then it's like we're on a reel and he just starts to bring us back in. Because we should notice that when he hits that stop button and we jerk to a stop, that's our call to say, all right, I've squandered everything. I have nothing else to live for. I have nowhere else to go. I need to turn back to the Father. And when we turn back to the Father, we see the error of our ways, and we experience that love that the Father has for us as his children. Then he starts to bring us back in. And he doesn't bring us back in with discipline. He doesn't bring us back in to forget about us and put us on the shelf. He brings us back in to embrace us, to throw us up in the air with love, and to catch us and say, welcome home. So I take that idea and I try to apply that to my son. And I will let him know that there will never be a time or never be an event that he can do or a place where he can go where I won't be there to help him, to guide him, or to welcome him back home, no matter what. And I hope that if he knows that, he has the confidence to know that my dad will always be behind me. And I will always have a dad that I can call father. So that's what I get from the story of the prodigal son. That's what I get from my heavenly father. And that's the thing that I'm trying to stress to my son as well. All right, we're on time. <laughs> so I guess it's time for my sermon. So open to Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. Now, just kidding. Um, we will pick up with that next week. But that said, um, it is good to have all these guys share this morning. And um, with that, you know, it's interesting. This is Father's Day, and you're going to see all kinds of things and hear all kinds of things. But ultimately, we have a Heavenly Father that loves us so much to send His Son to die on the cross for us. And the biggest thing about church, coming together for church, is what Christ has done for us. And to know that even if your father is gone, maybe you had a, a father who wasn't there, maybe you had a situation where your father didn't love you, you have a heavenly father who loves you more than you could ever imagine. And he loves you so much that he just wants to wrap his arms around you. And when you look at the prodigal son, you, you see that. Um, I, I'm going to show, show the video clip this morning. The father runs. You know, there's nowhere else in the Bible where the father runs. The father runs to the son, and that's a picture of our heavenly father. And it, it's interesting, the number of times I've, I've moved away and gone different places and everything, whenever I came home, it was always good to have my parents there and just have open arms to love you. You know, heaven waits for us, and it's the father with open arms. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. So the biggest joy about this is if, if your father's gone and, and I, you know, I'm glad I've had him for all the years I've been alive and, and he's still here, um, you know, to be 86 to have him, I, I thank God for that. But I also have been struggling a lot lately, like when he's gone, you know, um, and that's the hard part is you live life without that earthly father, but you know you have a heavenly father. So if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ, this morning's the time to do that, okay? To accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's the time to do it because he died on the cross for you so that you could have a relationship with the Heavenly Father, okay? So that said, we're going to pray, and then I'll have David lead us in our final song. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. And Lord, I pray for anyone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that Lord, they would say this morning, Jesus, I want a Heavenly Father. I want a Father who's going to love me and wrap their arms around me and runs to me, Lord. And I pray this morning that they would know that forgiveness, that Jesus forgives all our sins, that when we ask, they're removed as far as he is from the West. And Lord, he sends his Holy Spirit so that we can have a relationship with him and know him better. And then, Lord, I pray for any person here that they would have that that father relationship with you when they get out of here this morning. And so we ask that, Lord. And then I pray for each one of us, Lord, as we go out of here, that we would just rejoice in all that you've blessed us with and all that you've given us. Lord, you are a great and awesome God. And we thank you so very much. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So this is Awesome Dave, the one-man traveling band. And so this is, this is the guy that does our worship. So we're going to sing Good Good Father this morning.
And well, and his, si his sidekick, Pat, yes. Let's all stand so, together okay. and finish with Good, Good Father. <laughs> I've heard. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen, oh, and I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only because you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am because you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us let's sing that one more time you are you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect Perfect in all of your ways to us. Sing love. Is love so undeniable? I can hardly speak. Peace so unexplainable. I can hardly think as you call still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, because you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Sing that one more time right to him. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Amen. Amen. So before you leave this morning, make sure you give somebody a hug. Tell them that you were glad they were here this morning. We have some donuts and coffee and cake in the back. You're welcome to join us for that. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And may God watch over you, protect you, keep you, bless you, and just be with you this week. In Jesus' name, we give all the praise. Amen. Amen. Guys, have a great week. God bless you. Yes, on the 22nd.